Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church, Friday Night Live message. And this week's talk, God remembers the animals and so should we. So we'll begin in about one minute. Description of tonight's talk, God remembers the animals and so should we, based on Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Join us live as we examine the instances in which God remembers the animals throughout Scripture and how he calls us to likewise not forget them. So be sure to share this with whoever uh, might be interested in joining us and invite people to come join us for the live. We'll begin in one minute. Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church, Friday Night Live message. Today's topic, God remembers the animals and so should we. So this is based on Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. And a few announcements before we begin. We have Zoom fellowship, as we usually do, following the live talk. So if you'd like to join us for the Zoom fellowship, there's a, there's a link in the pinned comment. And we also have the Vegan Christian Discipleship School, which meets once a month, and this month's meeting is coming up on this Tuesday. It's 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific time, which translates to 1 o'clock Central, 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, and I believe that's 7 p.m. UK. So if you'd like to join us for that, you're welcome to do so. Uh, you would send an email to school at creationcarechurch.org and just say, I want to be part of the school and we'll send you the material and uh, a link to the Zoom meeting. And the topic for this one is predation. So how did the world get to be the way it is today with uh, all sorts of animals killing each other and people killing animals? How did that come about? And so now the third announcement is we have our Creation Care Church pamphlets. And if you'd like to order pamphlets, you can do so. Uh, by emailing info at creationcarechurch.org. So you have those things separated. So school, if you're trying to sign up for the school, but info if you want pamphlets. And of course, if you're going to be watching a certain film that comes out next month and you want to pass out these pamphlets to people as they're exiting the theater, I think that would be a great opportunity to bear witness to people. So you can email info at creationcarechurch.org and tell them your address, your name, and how many you would like. So now let's start with prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for all the people that you are bringing here today for this message and all the people who will hear it afterwards. And thank you for giving us insight into all the topics that uh, we have in our heart to learn. And just be with us today as we learn about how you remember the animals throughout scripture and that you call us to likewise remember them. So we pray this all in your son Jesus' name, Yeshua HaMashiach. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. So let's start with Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. And if you have any comments, be sure to ask those in the chat, and we'll get to that in the second part of the talk. So Genesis chapter 8, verse 1 says, Then God remembered Noah and every living creature, and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. So God basically tells the animals and Noah to all get on this ark to protect them from the impending flood. And then whenever the flood comes and destroys everything, then he remembers the animals and he remembers the people. And he remembers that he's going to make this covenant with them. And so then the 
the wind comes and basically the floodwaters subside. So he's remembering not just Noah, but he's remembering the animals. And it specifically mentions that he's remembering the animals. And then what does he do in chapter 9? So let's go to Genesis chapter 9, and let's read verses 12 to 16. So when he's remembering the animals, this is then what he does when he's speaking to the animals and to Noah after they get off the ark. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, kol baser, all flesh, that will come up again later. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So that term, all flesh, called baser, comes up three times there. And so God's making this covenant promise, not just to Noah, but also with the animals. So he remembers the animals, and he includes them in his covenant promise. So they are part of this covenant community where God is at the center and his whole creation is uh, serving him in obedience and out of love for each other. So now let's look at an instance in the New Testament where God again repeats that he doesn't forget the animals. Let's look at Luke chapter 12, verse 6. That's Luke chapter 12, verse 6. Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. So even though humans are selling animals, sacrificing animals, slaughtering animals, treating animals as if they're commodities to be traded uh, or treated not as sentient beings that God created uh, for, the, for their own purpose and are blessed by him, even though man is not doing what man is supposed to be doing, God does not forget the animals. So we want to remember that if we are forgetting the animals, then we're not being godlike. We're not acting in God's image and likeness if we are forgetting the animals. So we want to remember the animals just like God remembers the animals. So we don't want to be those who are selling the sparrows for the coins and treating them as commodities. We want to be those who are blessing the animals and making promises with the animals and being in community with the animals. So now let's look at how God has treated animals throughout history and their place in his design. So let's look at the Psalms. Let's turn to Psalm 145, verse 16. That's Psalm 145. Verse 16, it says, You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living creature. So this is something that God does. is He doesn't forget the animals. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to feed the humans because humans are important to me, and animals, well, you're not important to me. No, quite the opposite. He's saying, animals, you're important to me. Humans, you're also important to me. And I'm going to uh, feed those who... Uh, are human and also feed those who are animals. So that's why in another passage when he's talking about a similar thing, it says that, uh, are you not of more value than the animals? And well, that only makes sense if the animals are valuable to God. And so if the animals are valuable enough to God that he breathes his own breath of life into them, that he makes promises to them, that he blesses them, uh, then they should be imp that important to us as well. And so we are important to God, and so are the animals. And of course, when we're those faithful and wise stewards who are I acting in God's image and likeness, then we would likewise feed the animals at their proper time. And Jesus gives a parable about that. 
So let's look at another instance in which God remembers the animals. So let's look at Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. That's Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. And this comes when the Israelites are wandering in the desert and they are thirsty because they don't have any water. And if they had their little water bottle that has stickers about being against fur, they wouldn't be so thirsty. But uh, God remembers that not just the people need water, but also the animals. So let's look at Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. It says, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So he doesn't forget the animals. He doesn't say, well, let's just give the people water to drink. And why did God care about the animals? Was it just that, well, you need the, these animals so you can kill them and eat them, right? And they're just here for you. No, the opposite. He says, I want you to be eating this bread from heaven, this manna that descends from the sky. And so that's to be their food, not killing and eating the animals. And there's this whole business in, uh, elsewhere in Numbers where they, they crave meat, uh, etc. And they die in the grave of craving uh, for that. So we don't want to be dying in the grave of craving. We want to be seeing animals the way God sees them as these fellow creatures that uh, he provides for their needs just like he provides for ours. And elsewhere, uh, we're not going to turn there, but if you go to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4, that's where Paul says that Christ is that rock that gave them water. So Christ is here giving them the animals water and giving the people water when they need it. So now let's look at another instance. Let's go to the end of the book of Jonah. So Jonah, one of the minor prophets. So let's go to Jonah chapter four, verse 11. That's Jonah chapter four, verse 11. says, and should I not pity or have compassion on Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 people who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and also many animals? So here God is speaking to Jonah and he's like, should I not have compassion? Should I not care about all these people and all these animals that are in Nineveh? And so when they turned away from their wickedness and returned to God, they repented. And that's what repentance means. It means to turn away from wickedness and, and return to God in his ways. When they did that, he's like, I will not destroy you. I will save you from this imminent destruction that was bound to happen because of your wickedness, that the wickedness brings about this destruction. But now that they turn away from the wickedness, God protects them from that consequence. And so he cares about not just the people, but also the animals that would be swept up in that con those consequences. So let's look at a few other instances in which God, God always remembers the animals because it's not just God that we're talking about today. God remembers the animals, but it's so should we. And so he gives us instructions on how we should likewise remember the animals. That it's not just God's supposed to remember them and we can forget about them. So let's look at some of those instructions that he gave from, uh, from early on. So it says in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. It says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Well, why not? What's what's the point of this? Why would God be giving this instruction to the Israelites? Well, if you think of an ox when he's treading the grain, well, he's going to get hungry while he's he's working, right? Just like a person when when you're doing work, you get hungry because that's that's how things work. Well, if you're muzzling the ox, then the the ox can't 
eat while the ox is, is working. And so we don't want to be cruel to the animal. We don't want to keep the animal from being able to eat while they work. And so let the ox eat while he's treading the grain. And so this is an act of compassion saying, okay, even though you're, let's say, exploiting animals for their labor, uh, there, there's limits that I don't want you to be doing these things at all, but I want you to understand compassion. And so I want you to understand that uh, you, you shouldn't be thinking, well, I just want to maximize profit and these, the ox is eating part of my profit. And it kind of reminds me of, we see this in dairy farms where they'll, uh, where they'll impregnate the mother cow so that she produces milk that's intended for her baby. And they don't want the baby to have that milk because that's, that's what they're profiting off of. So uh, they want to sell that to humans, adult humans, to drink this milk that's intended for baby cows. As strange as that might seem to those of us who don't do that, that's what's normalized and that's how they make profit by deceiving people into thinking this is, no, this is what the people are supposed to do. But what they do is they'll take the baby and they'll put this like spiky nose ring on her, on her mouth so that when she goes to suckle from her mother, uh, the, the mother will be like, ow, you just like poked me with those spikes, like get away from me. And of course, like you're stabbing your, your mother uh, with these spikes. But it's obviously not the baby's fault, it's the farmer's fault for intentionally putting that on, on the baby's nose. And he does that so that uh, the milk can be sold to humans. And I just think of how cruel that is that this milk that's intended for the baby, not, are, not only are you taking that milk to sell to humans, but you're making it to where that baby can't get any of it. And then you send that baby to slaughter to be turned into veal. So that's just the, the cruelty that, that man envisions. And God is saying, look, don't go down that road of intense cruelty like that. Uh, don't be muzzling the ox. And I'm sure at the time when he was writing this, he wasn't even thinking about the immense cruelty of factory farms and things like that that we've envisioned since then. So now that we've gone over such a lovely topic, let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. So Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. And here is another instruction where there is, uh, where animals are not forgotten and he's saying animals are part of this covenant community. So remember, these Ten Commandments are defining this, this covenant community under God. So let's go with uh, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day, the Shabbat, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in, the six, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, or set it apart. So he's saying, don't overwork people. Just because somebody works for you, don't cause them to work seven days a week. And you yourself, don't be overcome by work and overwork yourself. Have compassion on yourself. But then also, if you're exploiting animals, uh, don't do so in a way that is uh, unbearably cruel. Uh, but all the, the Sabbath is, is later referred to as a sign of this covenant community. So the animals are part of this covenant community, just like he created and blessed them from the beginning. And so this is just another instance where God is telling us, I don't forget the animals and I don't want you to forget the animals either. So these have to do with compassion that we're supposed to be showing to animals. And just because this might be the minimum amount that he's suggesting here, that doesn't mean that we should only do the minimum. We should do the maximum. We should do what is best in God's eyes instead of just striving for, well, how much uh, cruelty and exploitation am I allowed to do? That's the wrong question. We should be saying, what's the ideal in God's mind and how can I live up to that ideal? So now let's turn to some things in the New Testament that uh, are said about God remembering the animals. 
So remember the Great Commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28, where he says, go make disciples of all the world, baptizing them and uh, teaching them all that I've uh, commanded you to obey. And now what does he say when he talks about that at the end of Mark? He phrases it a little bit differently in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He says, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. Interesting. So if we're supposed to be going out and preaching this message, well, we're supposed to be doing it not just to people, but also to animals. So we don't want to be exclusive about that. And so now let's look at another instance where uh, this is a sign of who's supposed to be Isaac's wife. Let's go to Genesis chapter 24, verse 14. So that's Genesis chapter 24, verse 14. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And then, of course, Rebecca is the one who does that. So why is this the sign that Rebecca is to be the chosen wife for Isaac? Well, she's showing compassion, not just for this person who's thirsty, but she also doesn't forget the animals, just like God doesn't forget the animals. And so Rebecca did not forget the, the animals. She said, oh, you're thirsty? I bet your camels are thirsty too. And so even though he didn't ask for water for his camels, he only asked water for himself. She didn't forget the animals, and that was the sign that she was the chosen one to be Isaac's wife. And so uh, if you want to be the chosen one, the one that God chooses, you shouldn't forget the animals either. And I hope that we all want to be chosen by God. So now let's look at, let's go back to New Testament. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. We'll look at verses 11 and 12. So that's Matthew chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Then Jesus said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? And how much more value, then, is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So remember, we were talking about the Sabbath earlier. And so the Sabbath, the animals are part of this Sabbath community, this covenant community. And so he's saying here, who among you, if one of your sheep is in danger on the Sabbath, is going to wait a whole day to rescue this sheep? Well, of course not, uh, because you know that you're doing good. You're doing an act of compassion. You're helping a creature in need. And so it's lawful to do good things on the Sabbath. And so this whole point of, are you not more valuable than the sheep? Well, that implies that the sheep are valuable to God and God cares about them. Because if they weren't valuable to God, then what kind of comparison would this be? It's like, well, you're more valuable than the animals, but the animals have no value. Well, maybe you don't have any value then either, <laughs> right? You see how that wouldn't work if the animals don't have value to God? And they're obviously not instrumental value. It's not just, well, they're here for you to kill and eat, or they're here because I like the smell of their burning carcasses on an altar or, or something like that. Uh, because of all those passages that we've already gone over, clearly God cares about the animals uh, for their intrinsic value because he cares about them as individuals and not because of uh, what they can do or provide for humans. So let's stay in Matthew. Now let's go to Matthew 18, verse 12. So Matthew chapter 18, verse 12. And just to clarify, uh, I'm sure maybe somebody has a question about this. We've done a live talk on the topic of what does it mean to be more valuable than the animals? And I take that to be that uh, our role is more important. And when we were created in God's image and likeness and given dominion over the animals, uh, we were designed to be the creature that cares for all the other creatures. And so if uh, we're not doing our job, then sort of all the creatures are in trouble. 
So we're more valuable in the same way that like an airplane pilot is the most valuable person on an airplane, because if something happens to the pilot, everyone's doomed. So anyway, we already did a live talk on that. You can look that up if you'd like more on that. So now Matthew 18, verse 12. Jesus says, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? So again, this is uh, where Jesus is showing us that even somebody who doesn't have the level of concern for animals that they should, even they understand what it means to have compassion on God's creatures. That, look, if one of your sheep goes away, you go after and look for that sheep. You don't say, ah, eh, I'll write it off on my taxes. Uh, I'll make an insurance claim. Like, well, I, I guess nowadays that is actually what they do. They're like, oh, well, there's a flood. Instead of rescuing the animals, I'll just let them die and I'll collect the insurance money. So I, I guess we have gone beyond even the minimum that that is <laughs> described to us in these some of these scripture passages. So the, the cruelty of man has, has no bounds. That, that, I guess, is understood. But the point here is that people already understand what compassion for animals is, and so he's calling us to an even greater compassion toward animals. So now let's look at where it talks about what does it mean to be righteous and how this applies to animals. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10. So Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10 says, A righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Another translation says, The kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. So we want to be righteous in God's eyes. We want to have that righteousness that comes from, from faith. So we want to be caring for the animals. And we don't want our kindest acts to be cruel. We don't want to be thinking, Well, I only care about animals insofar as it benefits me. Well, that then every act of compassion you have toward animals is selfish and is still wicked. So we want to be selfless in our stewardship of the animals, just as Christ, who is uh, Lord over us, he is selfless toward us. And he says, I came to serve, not to be served. We want to think of animals in the same way. So now, and of course, Jesus is the, the good shepherd. He says, I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I believe that is uh, John chapter 10 and around verses 14, 15, maybe a little bit uh, before that. And so we want to be those good shepherds, not just those shepherds, those hired hands who leave the flock to get killed by the wolves. We want to be protecting those, those sheep. And of course, the sheep know the sound, know the voice of their shepherd. And so if the sheep uh, aren't looking to you as their protector, uh, the animals aren't looking to you as their protector, then it's because they don't hear the voice of their protector in you. So we want to change that. And so now let's go to Luke chapter 19, verses 45 to 48. So this is Luke chapter 19, verses 45 to 48. So this is an instance where Jesus makes it abundantly clear, clear that he does, in fact, care about the animals. So God cares about the animals and tells us we should likewise care about the animals, not forget them. Well, here's Jesus not forgetting the animals. So Luke chapter 19, verses 45 to 48 says, Then he, Jesus, went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it. So they're buying and selling these animals, and he's driving out these people who are buying and selling animals to be slaughtered. And he says to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. And were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So what is Jesus doing here? If you've uh, been to a church and, and heard a pastor talk on why Jesus was disrupting the temple, you've probably heard this pastor say something like, oh, well, it was the money changers. They were ripping people off. Well, where in this account in Luke are the money changers even mentioned? They're not. They're only mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and John's accounts. And so if Luke doesn't even think it's important enough to even mention the money changers, clearly that's not the main part of the story. 
And also, if it were about the, the people just ripping people off and overcharging for these animals, then why wouldn't Jesus quote one of the Proverbs that says, uh, don't do dishonest business with weighted scales, like if that's really what it was about. Instead, he's quoting Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, which is in the context of uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 and 8, where Jeremiah is saying, uh, God never commanded animal sacrifice. This was the lying pen of the priestly scribe that added these things in, and you've made my father's house a den of violent ones, which is actually what that term means. It's parasium, which is Strong's Hebrew 6530, if you want to look it up for yourself. Uh, this translated thieves, it's actually violent ones. So you've made my father's house, which was supposed to be a house of prayer, into a house of violence. And so, of course, he's talking about the animal sacrifices themselves. He's saying God doesn't want these things. Get these things out of here. And that's what he's doing. He's driving them out. So it's not about the money changers ripping people off. It's, uh, it's about the people turning God's uh, place of uh, prayer into a place of violence. So now let's look at a few more scripture verses that have to do with God. He didn't forget them in the past. He didn't forget the animals at any point. He, he doesn't forget animals today, and he hasn't forgotten about the future he has in store for the animals. So let's look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 18. That's Hosea chapter 2, verse 18. He says, in that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. So the same categories that we remember God making covenant promise with in the Genesis 9, when he's making a covenant promise with all the animals, and he makes these same distinctions, the animals of the land, the animals of the air, the animals under the ground, the animals on the ground, all the animals. So he's making a covenant with all the animals. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them all lie down safely. There will be no instruments of violence, no perpetrators of violence. All the animals will lie down safely. That's God's promise, and he's not forgetting the animals. And so remember when, we, when we're looking at Genesis 9 and he was making this promise to all the animals, the, the term kol baser came up three times where he says, my covenant is with all the animals and all the people. It's with all flesh, kol baser. He uses that multiple times to indicate all flesh as in all humans and all animals. And so now here he's making this promise to the, to the future that includes the animals so now this is Hosea, and this is, so now let's go to another prophet. Let's go to Joel. Let's go to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. So it's Joel chapter 2, verse 28. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, called Baser. So who's he pouring this, uh, his spirit out on? all the flesh, all the humans, and all the animals. It says, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and young men will see visions. So just like that vision in Isaiah of all the animals lying down in peace together, the vision in Hosea of all the animals lying down in peace together, and there's no perpetrators of violence, the vision of all the prophets, and that's why we're prophesying, we're having visions, and his spirit is poured out on the people and the animals. So it says, as it puts it in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, uh, all will have knowledge of God as the, the waters fill the seas. So it's this knowledge of God that everyone will have. So we're, we're, we've completed the preaching of the gospel to every creature, and the Holy Spirit has been poured out on every creature, and all are praising God, all are following God in obedience, and the whole world is exactly the way God designed it to be from the beginning. So what will that look like? Let's go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 13. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 13 says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea. So again, these categories, all the animals in the sky, all the animals in the sea, all the animals on the ground, all the animals underground, under the ground, all the animals, this all flesh, all animals that he makes this covenant promise with. 
He says, I heard all of these creatures and all that are in them. I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Who's the lamb? Jesus. So Jesus is on the throne and all creatures are singing these praises to God. Just like it says in Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so we want to likewise be praising God and we want to be remembering the animals just as God remembers the animals. And so we wanna remember that they are part of our covenant community. They are friends, they are not to be exploited, they are not food. And so we wanna think of them as our fellow members of the covenant community of God. And so we wanna praise God and allow the animals to likewise praise God alongside us. So let's not forget the animals. Now, if you have any questions or comments, I'll get to that now. Jason Bueno. Hi, Jason. Good to have you. He says, hey, I made it to a live stream. Awesome. Glad you're here. And Rosalind, welcome everyone. Greetings from Leeds, UK. Hi, Rosalind. Glad to have you. Jewel. Evening from Minnesota. Hello, glad to have you, Jewel. Lily, hi everyone watching from California. Hi, Lily. Tim Brown, hello, every, hello everyone from Tim and Kathy in Ohio. Hi, Tim and Kathy. Let's see, Kathy from Minnesota. Hi, Kathy. Sharon, hello from Massachusetts. Hi, Sharon. Let's see, first question, how many covenants in the Bible are animals included in? Well, I would say most of them. Uh, I, I know that Hosea and Genesis and Isaiah are the ones that are mentioned, or the animals are specifically mentioned as being part of it. But if we look at all the overlapping prophecies in Isaiah, Amos, Micah, uh, pretty much all throughout the prophets, that we see that there's a place for the animals. So for instance, Isaiah 2 verse 4 says they will beat their swords into plowshares and no longer learn war anymore. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like that prophecy in Hosea 2.18 where he's making the promise to the animals saying there will be no more weapons of violence, no more, uh, no more bow and sword of battle, and that all the animals will lie down in safety. Well, that's when everyone's beating their swords into plowshares, right? So even the ones that that don't specifically mention animals, it's clear that it's referring to the same promises that are also made for the animals. So I would say that this, this promise that God makes of uh, the, the, there coming a time where the entire world will be restored to what it was meant to be, and that the animals have a part in that, uh, that there's a place for them, means that all of these promises that have to do with this kingdom uh, are promises to the animals as well. So I don't know what that number is, how many times God makes promises to his creation, uh, but there's definitely a handful where he specifically mentions the animals, and I think that all the animals would be included. Let's see, Anamique, hello from Holland. Hi, Anamique. Renee from New Jersey. Hi, Renee. Blake, good evening from Dallas. Hi, Blake. It's nice to, to see all these familiar uh, names. Uh, it's nice to see everyone when you're showing up. See, Jason, let's not eat our valuables. <laughs> yeah, so we want to make sure that we're not eating God's creatures and taking away uh, the breath of God's creatures when he says that they have value to him. And so if they're valuable enough to God to breathe his own breath of life into them, to give them life, if they're valuable enough for him to bless them, and if they're valuable enough for him to make promises to them, then they should be valuable enough to where we don't harm them or kill them, right? Patricia, watching from Alabama. Hi, Patricia. Lisa, hi from McKinney, Texas. Hi, Lisa. Let's see, no business with the ox comment from God to be in there isn't he didn't care. 
if he didn't care. Okay, so he wouldn't have mentioned the ox if he didn't care about the ox. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, and I think that's a clear indication as we've gone over several scriptures today where God specifically doesn't forget the animals. And so I think he, he specifically mentions animals from time to time so that we don't just think, oh, well, God's only talking about humans. Like, well, no, he's not. He's talking about the animals too. And so he has to constantly remind us so that we don't forget the animals, just like he doesn't forget the animals. Let's see, Lily. Uh, there's so much wrong with dairy. It's diabolical. When you see how much selfishness and cruelty is involved. Amen. And this is one of those things where you know, sometimes somebody will say, well, I, I, I'm not convinced by the evidence that a plant-based diet is the healthiest diet. I think that there's some health merit to eating, I don't know, insert whatever thing that they don't want to give up from their diet. But when it comes to dairy, like even if we just step back for a second and like ignore all the cruelty involved in the dairy industry, and we just kind of think of things logically and you go, Okay, well, why does a mother produce milk? Well, obviously, no matter what species you are, if you're a mammal, then you're a mother producing milk for your baby, right? That's what mammals do. That, that's how that works. And so a mother cow, who is her milk intended for? Her baby. And so if you're drinking the milk of a mother cow, you're drinking food that's supposed to be for a baby cow. So on that level, it makes completely no sense to think that the milk is for me. And even if we just think of it as like, okay, what about a human mother? All right, well, a human baby is supposed to drink the, the milk from a human mother. So that makes sense that humans can drink milk. But then if you think of an adult human, somebody who's in their 20s or 30s or 40s or however old somebody is, and they're still breastfeeding from their mom, aren't you going to be like, look, dude, like, I think you're getting a little too old for this. I think you need to start with solid food. And so we have these adult humans drinking milk that's intended for baby cows. Like it's just backwards on every level you can imagine. And so that's not even to get into the animal cruelty involved, not even to get into the, the health issues with, you know, drinking something that contains all the cholesterol and uh, causes, you know, the acidity that'll cause osteoporosis and all kinds of other things that are wrong with it. Just, you just think of it about it logically. It's like, this makes absolutely no sense. And yet they're just deceived into thinking, well, I need, I need milk for my body. No, you don't. You don't need cow's milk any more than you need rhino's milk or giraffe milk or kangaroo milk or any other kind of milk, dog milk, cat milk. So you, you can get by just fine without that. You can get just get by just fine without cow's milk too. Anyway, that's my tangent about dairy. And I obviously agree with you that it's diabolical too. Let's see, a story of a mama cow hiding her baby helped turn me towards being vegan. Yeah, and I, th I probably know what you're talking about. If this isn't the one you have in mind, this is another instance where basically a mother cow had twins and the previous couple of births that she had, the farmer went and took away her baby a couple of days after birth. And so this time she hid one of her babies at the side of the fence. And so then when the farmer came, she's like, look, there's my baby that you're going to steal. And so he steals the baby and she's like, oh no, you stole my baby again. And, but she's smart and she knew that he was going to come by to steal the baby. So she, she kept one in plain sight that he would steal. And, but then she hid the other one. And so uh, that's the, the ingenuity of the mother to save one of her children. And then, of course, the cruelty of man found out and stole the other one anyway. But uh, we, just, <clears throat> we, yeah, I'm glad that for you that had that effect of uh, transforming you where you kind of understood, hey, this isn't probably what we're supposed to be doing. See, like St. Francis, yep, he was an advocate for animals. See, Tina, hi from central Pennsylvania. Hi, Tina, I'm glad you made it here. 
and that you, you found it. See, our cat Wicket has been on my lap this whole talk. He isn't normally a lap cat. Awesome. Well, glad to hear that uh, I am fulfilling my calling to preach the gospel to every creature and that your, your creature that you live with is hearing the gospel message through our live talk. Glad that your cat can show up. So welcome, Wicket. Glad you could join us. Let's see, Kathy from Minnesota. I read, or I read that the Hebrew word for remember, zakar, means that God is not recalling something like he forgot it. When he is remembering, he acts on their behalf. He acts on behalf of those whom he remembers. He engages in rescuing, saving, redeeming those whom he remembers. It also means when he doesn't remember our sins, is for him not to act in judgment upon us. Yeah, so that's a good point. And when he says, I will remember your sins no more, it's because he forgives our sins. And when he says, if you turn away from your sin, I will forgive you. And so we want to turn away from it. We want to turn away from our wicked ways, the things that separate us from, our, from God's creation and from God. And so he wants us to turn away from those things. And then he, he forgets uh, by forgiving and wiping it clean. And the other thing that he does that you mentioned is when he's remembering it, yeah, it's not that God just has a bad memory. <laughs> like, that's not what it is. It's, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's that saving. So when we think of God remembering the animals that were on the ark, and he remembers the animals and he makes the covenant with them, well, he's saving them from this flood that would have otherwise destroyed them. And so it's his saving power that is the remembering. So that's a, that's a good sort of additional point that you brought up there. Zakar. See, dun dun dun. Jesus was an animal rights activist. Shh, it's a secret. <laughs> the secret's out. Let's see, Blake, many people cry out for God's mercy but aren't willing to be merciful. I, I can't ask for something from God that I'm not willing to become. Amen. And uh, Jesus and James both sort of echo what you're saying, where James says, uh, judgment, let's see, what does he say? To those who don't show mercy, they'll receive judgment in, in like manner or something like that. Uh, and then Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And then, of course, he gives that parable of the person who did not show mercy, and then he got locked up and had to repay every last penny. And so he says, you should likewise be merciful. And of course, Luke 6.36, where Jesus specifically outright says, be merciful, just as your father is merciful. So absolutely, we should be merciful. And if we're asking God to be merciful on us, how much should we be merciful toward those around us, both humans and animals? So absolutely. Let's see, Lily, so true. I wish every Christian in the world would realize that. Mm -hmm. That's in response to Blake's comment. Let's see, pin Blake's comment, yep. Blake doesn't usually say a lot of things, but when he does, they're usually gems. So thanks for your participation, Blake. Nicola, that's skipping to the bottom again. Here we go. Yes, everyone here needs to watch Christ's spiracy. It validates everything. Instead of a den of thieves, it truly means a den of violence, murders, as Craig said. Yep, uh, I was able to watch that uh, this a uh, couple days ago. So looking forward to that coming out next month. Let's see, Jason, I'm excited for this to get out there. Yep. Let's see, Jessica, Cole de Sar. Oh, uh, Cole Basar, all the flesh was the forbidden fruit from the tree of life. Or from the, I guess if it's the, if it's the forbidden fruit, it would be from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
the reverse of the tree of life, which I know that's what you meant. Uh, we're, we're working on doing a live talk on this. I'll have to get back to you on this, but I have some exciting stuff to share with you that I'm sure you'll be happy to hear. But yeah, the, the, the Kol Baser All Flesh is K-O-L space B-A-S-A-R. So that would be the, the two term. Kol means all and Baser means flesh. So when God's talking about Kol Baser, all flesh, he's talking about humans and animals. Let's see, Tim, yes, Hosea 2.18 reminds us that the Lord is returning us to the love of the Garden of Eden. Isaiah 11.6-9 shows us the way it is getting more and more challenging having dinner with these self-righteous Christians and watching them chow down on their meat. Yeah, and it's it's definitely disheartening to, to hear people praise God with their mouth and then stick these like dead animals into that same mouth, completely ignoring his instructions where he's saying don't do that. And so... I just wish that this hypocrisy would just evaporate and people would would just open their eyes and open their hearts and see the truth. And hopefully uh, with time that will happen, but we'll see. Let's see, Hillary, hi friends from Saturday morning in Brisbane, Australia. Hi Hillary, glad you could join us. Welcome. Colette from the UK. Hello, Colette. Glad you could join us. Laura, hello from South Carolina. Hi, Laura. Let's see, 60% of the USA is lactose intolerant. Yeah, sometimes whenever I'll go somewhere and I'll say, does this contain dairy? They'll ask me, are you lactose intolerant? And I say, no, I'm just intolerant to animal cruelty. <laughs> but I think all of us are you know, unless we're babies, we should be lactose intolerant. See, Kathy, the word wickedness in Hebrew means doing something with a thing it wasn't intended for, like people drinking cow's milk. Yeah, so that's also connected to covetousness. So if we're coveting, we're desiring something that's not intended for us. So cow's milk would definitely be an instance of coveting. I think that's probably one of the clearest instances uh, that you could possibly even use as an example of coveting. It's like, is this milk that a mother cow produces for her baby cow, is that intended for an adult human? No, obviously not. Well, are you desiring it? Yes. Okay, well, then you're coveting. So you're sinning if you're desiring to drink cow's milk or cheese or anything else that's uh, produced by a cow for her baby. Let's see, Jewel. God designed every being to raise its own young. Cow's milk is to grow a 1,500 to 2,000 pound cow. Nutrients not for humans. Yep, exactly. Let's see, T. Set it off, Craig. Prayer hands. Amen. I'm not sure what that would have been in reference to. Probably my tangent about the dairy industry, I'm guessing. I guess it's not a tangent. It's on topic, but... Yeah, I know that you're in agreement with that, as I hope most of the people here are. See, Sharon, compassion for another human or animal comes from humility. When we honor the creator, we acknowledge he is far greater than we are. We learn compassion and mercy from God. Amen. I think that's a, another good connection to make is humility, where we want to humble ourselves and not think, well, I'm more valuable. I can do whatever I want to animals. Or God gave me this sort of authority when he gave us dominion, even though obviously in the next verse he tells us to be vegan. And so that's not the authority he's granting us with dominion, so we definitely shouldn't appeal to that. But whatever we want to appeal to, I think we should be honoring our creator. And the way we honor the creator is by doing his will, by doing the things he instructs us to do. And so when he tells us to be these good stewards of his creation, we should do that. And we should humble ourselves and not think, well, what's in it for me? Or do I want to do this? We should just do it because that's what's honoring to God. So amen to that, Sharon. See, Julie. Hello, Julie. Animals don't even need mercy, though, because they are already bl blameless, right? Mercy is for those who don't deserve it, isn't it? 
Well, they, they definitely deserve our mercy. Um, they, I, I think what you're saying is they don't, they don't need God's mercy because it's like they didn't do anything wrong in order to like need it. Whereas if someone did something wrong, they would need God's mercy. So I, I think I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah, like God, God shows his compassion on all the animals, just like it says with uh, Nineveh. He says, should I not have compassion on this city of 120,000 people and all these animals? So God clearly has compassion on them. And the words compassion and mercy are often sort of uh, interchangeable, uh, depending on what translation you're using. And so, yeah, the animals definitely need our our compassion and our mercy, and they're getting that from God anyway. Let's see, I heard mercy meant to help someone even when they don't deserve it. Uh, so I guess grace would be like, if somebody owes you a debt, then you can show grace by giving them more time or reducing the debt, and then forgiving is like, you don't owe me anything. And I think mercy is uh, it could be used in that same connection with grace, uh, but it, I don't think it necessarily has to. For instance, in Hosea 6.6, 6, he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And so when he's saying, I don't want you to be sacrificing, slaughtering animals, I want you to be showing them mercy, then I don't think it necessarily implies that the animals are in debt in some way, that like they need to be shown mercy as like grace for a debt that they owe. I think it's more of just an orientation of, uh, I'm going to be merciful, compassionate toward you. I'm not going to cause you harm. I'm going to be of benefit to you. And so uh, God wanting us to be merciful toward the animals instead of slaughtering them, uh, I think that that just means I want you to be a merciful person, just like he says in Luke 6.36. So that's kind of my understanding of, of what mercy would be. Let's see, Lily. I have found in online discussions and debates that there is much pride from Christians about being made in God's image and about having dominion, which, as you said, is the opposite of how it should be. We should have humility, which is what God wants from us, and of course, kindness and compassion and respect for all of God's creatures. Amen. And I think that that's one thing that people often overlook. They say, I have dominion in God's image and likeness. Therefore, I'm going to do the opposite of what God would do. It's like, what? How does that make any sense? <laughs> it's like, he's, that's a responsibility. We're supposed to be acting according to God's will. That's what it would mean to be doing these things in God's image and likeness. So don't just look at the image and go, I have the authority, and then forget the likeness. We want to have the likeness, too. And if God is love and God is showing compassion, we should do likewise. Let's see. Colette, God gave us vegetables and fruit to eat in the Garden of Eden. Amen. And he never changed his mind. That was Genesis 129. He said, this is the very good diet that I give you. So Dominion 128, then be vegan 129. So they go together. So if we want to have dominion, God's image and likeness, the very first thing that God says this entails is being vegan. So let's make sure our dominion looks like what God tells us it's supposed to look like. Let's see. So uh, it looks like we have a couple more comments, but for the sake of time, uh, I want to make sure we tell you about next week's talk. So thanks, everyone, for your participation. The last few comments I'll get to uh, by through text. Next week's talk is Building Church Community. And that is based on 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. So we'll talk about how, uh, to, how to build church community, and not just like communities, like plural, uh, but how to foster this, this sense of community uh, with other members of the, the body of Christ, which is the church, is the body of Christ. So what are some, some practical things you can do? What are some sort of principles, some ways you can maybe uh, restructure your life, not necessarily maybe in a major way, but steps you could take to uh, build church community, both uh, with your involvement in Creation Care Church, but also just as members of the body of Christ as a whole. So we hope that you could join us again next week for that live talk.
And now, before we start our fellowship, I want to close in prayer. So our Heavenly Father, thank you for all the wonderful people that you've brought here and this community that you are building here at Creation Care Church. And thank you for all the, the participation of people and the encouragement that people gain uh, from being part of this community. Thank you for all the different parts that each of us plays. And we just thank you for not, remem not, well, not forgetting the animals and putting it on our hearts to likewise remember the animals. And Lord, just continue to bring us up, bring us closer to you, uh, guide us into all things and allow us to grow closer to you, to, to grow in Christ. And let us not be stubborn and obstinate of heart, um, refusing to do your will, but instead let us say, here I am, Lord, I'm here to do your will. And just let us live according to your purpose and spread the good news uh, to all of creation. And so we pray this all in your son Jesus' name, Yeshua HaMashiach, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. So thank you everyone for joining us, and we look forward to having you again next week. God bless.